Welcome to Chai with Manjula. Our guest today is truly a visionary and global leader in the field of sustainable development and one of the world's leading experts on the environment. He is the founder and chairman of the Development Alternatives Group, the premier social enterprise working on issues of sustainable development. The organization has generated 1 million jobs in India and India today named it one of the 10 most powerful environmental movements in the country. He is co-president of the Club of Rome and president of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. He was the founding director of India's Office of Environmental Planning and Coordination and also director of the United Nations Environment Program. He was awarded the Stockholm Challenge Award in 2002. the UN Sasakawa Environment Prize also in 2002 and the Schwab Foundation's award for outstanding social entrepreneur in 2004 educated at Cambridge and Harvard he went on to teach Harvard's first undergraduate course on the environment a course that famously inspired vice president Al Gore it is certainly an honor to have Dr Ashok Khosla on the show Dr. Khosla, welcome to Chai with Manjula. Thank you. I've heard and read a lot about you, and I was so fascinated by the fact that you were always ahead of your time. You taught a course on the environment at Harvard in the 60s when environment was not even an issue. That's true. Then you left for India in around 71, I think, the time when Indians had actually started coming to That's America. That's true. I was going the other way all the time. Right. And then you started uh, an organization about sustainable development in India way before the economic boom hit the country. Yes. And that's your baby and I would like to talk about that. And I believe that development alternatives is not only about saving the environment, but it's also about eradicating poverty. Yes, Manjula, in fact, it's the other way around. It was set up really to eradicate poverty. Oh, I see. And we found that you couldn't do that without reviving the environment because very poor people, like all of us, uh, depend for a large part of our needs mm -hmm. on uh, Mother Nature. <laughs> and much of what we uh, eat and drink and wear and, and even make houses with um, comes from our resource base. Right. And so we found that Uh, there was no way really to eradicate poverty to make the life of a very poor woman in a village better mm -hmm. without bringing back the water and the soils and the forests and mm -hmm. so i got very much into both mm -hmm. because the two are totally related right They're right right two sides of the same coin uh -huh. so now the economic growth in india how has it affected the poor in the country has it helped them or has it left them behind Well, you know, if you talk to government officials and uh and World Bank people, they all say that India has a much bigger middle class now and mm -hmm. it's 250 million this or that. And indeed, there is certainly the improvement of lives uh at the level of people like you and me. Many, many more people mm -hmm. uh, can afford many more things, cars, houses, better clothes, better food. But there are still 700, maybe 800 million people who have been left behind. Oh, who yeah. are uh less than mm -hmm. um comfortable and have less than good lives. Mm -hmm. Uh their children don't go to school, they don't get enough food, uh their nourishment is very poor. Uh their healthcare and their access to resources, but particularly jobs. Nice. Uh is extremely difficult. So uh really speaking it depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. If you are well off, India is a great place. Uh if you're not so well off it's probably as hard to live there as anywhere in the world. So I really have devoted most of my work to the lives of poor people uh -huh. and so I see that end much more. So although my friends often get annoyed with me, I have to say that India is worse off right now than it was oh. before. Okay. And with poverty of course comes Uh, the problem of population growth and it is projected that by the year 2050 india will have the largest population in the world and the world will have uh, another 3 billion people That's right. so how how do you suggest 
that they control population in India? Well, the only, the only real contraceptive in, in this world that works is improving the lives of people. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, clearest and, and shortest way to reach the demographic transition where both birth rates and death rates come down significantly mm -hmm. is to um, improve the lives of very poor people yeah. as fast as possible. And how do you uh, do that? Well, you do that by directing your uh, energies and your uh, policies and your fin financial uh, resources mm -hmm. towards the problem of the poor. Uh, yes. At the moment, we've uh, been very good at solving the problems of the rich mm -hmm. and making them still richer. Uh, but in fact, it's a very misplaced priority because they don't have very many kids. It's the poor who have large numbers of kids, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that we have to now uh, bring into the mainstream economy. And whenever you do that, whenever uh, the life of a woman in a village improves, mm -hmm. as we've seen over and over again, maybe because of a job, maybe because of other circumstances, mm -hmm. um, her desire for a family goes dramatically down from five or six children to one or two children. Why is it that the poor have more children? Well, this is because they need them. I mean, they uh, essentially make a calculation, and it's not necessarily an explicit one, mm -hmm. uh, of the benefits and the costs of another child. Uh, they have to have children for helping them in the fields. They have to have children to look after them in old age. They have to have children to work uh, in um, the sit town or city to help uh, bring in money. So there's many reasons why uh, it pays to have children. Uh, as soon as you take those reasons away, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, people don't want uh, so many children. I don't think I know very many women who really want to have unlimited numbers of children. They basically have them because their mothers-in-law and their f husbands and their families uh, force them to have uh, larger families because economically it makes sense to them, particularly for old age and for other things too. I see. And talking about the economic growth, rapid economic growth usually harms the environment and drains natural resources. Are countries like India and China growing at the expense of the environment and how can economic growth and environmental health be compatible? Well, I, I'm not sure I agree that uh, environment has to be de be destroyed in order to have economic yes. growth. Um, that depends on the kind of economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, if your economic growth depends heavily on using resources and on producing waste, yes, you're going to have very large-scale environmental problems. Mm -hmm. But growth can come in many different ways. And uh, a well-conceived growth, a sustainable development, if you like, mm -hmm. of a country does not necessarily imply major um, destruction of the environment. Mm -hmm. It means uh, a different way of doing things so that you get both the environmental values mm -hmm. uh, and your um, improved material well-being. Now, the problem, of course, is that we've conceived of growth as being essentially materials, mm -hmm. more cars, more houses, more clothes, more everything, uh, and more roads and more airplanes. And now all of that kind of growth obviously is going to have a large-scale mm -hmm. impact on the environment. But it is conceivable to have a very good life with other kinds of approaches. Which to, are? Which, are, which, are, which decouple, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, growth from um, the well-being of both people as well as nature. I see. So we, we can see that. We use more efficient techniques for mm -hmm. making houses and infrastructure. You use less materials uh, which, are, which are destructive. Uh, you use more of um, your ingenuity and you use more of your knowledge to do things properly. And um, some countries, of course, have been able to do better than others. I see. Um, the Scandinavian countries, for example, mm -hmm. have been able to lead extremely high quality lives, but their use of their energy and water resources and so on is much more uh, conservative than in, uh, in many other countries. I see. Development Alternatives, the organization that you founded and serve as chairman, is a leading organization in the area of sustainable development. Can you tell us about the work that the organization is doing? Yes, um, it was set up about 30 years ago, 28, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. essentially in response to the problem that we saw uh, afflicting our countries in the south and in, in, in the developing world, 
um, of extreme poverty and the inability of people to get out of that mm-hmm. uh, in the current, um, in the then prevailing economic systems. Now they're even worse, of course, but in those days already, it was hard to see how uh, poor people would be able to get out of the trap that they were in mm-hmm. with um, very bad, poor quality resources, large families, no markets. The whole thing was a vicious cycle and they could never get out. Uh, so the purpose of development alternatives was to find root causes and attack them. The root cause of uh, poverty, of course, is um, the lack of access, the lack of access to land, the lack of access to assets, mm-hmm. the productive assets, the lack of access to knowledge and education. And so um, the poor people are not lazy. They just don't have the same things as you and I have. Mm -hmm. And our children can basically do a lot better simply because they've got those assets, that capital investment that we put Uh into them uh, in terms of knowledge and and education and everything else. So I started uh, Development Alternatives basically to look at how do you jumpstart, how do you essentially make a quantum jump in terms of people's lives by innovation, particularly Mm -hmm. technical innovation, Uh, but also institutional innovation. How do you uh, develop mechanisms for producing and and marketing and delivering solutions that people need? So we started with uh, major league uh, innovations in the field of housing and water and energy and sanitation, uh, designing new kinds of toilets, new kinds of water systems, uh, new kinds of livelihoods, job-creating systems. For example, this is made out of our handloom uh, machines that we develop. We also make um, recycled paper and, and use lots of um, uh, raw materials which come from industrial wastes into productive okay. things. So we, in a sense, uh, were rethinking mm-hmm. development because the poor of whom, according to the census of the government of India, uh, more than 40 million families needed homes. Now, if you made those homes with conventional techniques, using steel and cement and bricks, there would be no, no resources left. You would mm-hmm. wipe out the whole countryside uh, and the whole agricultural soil would be turned into bricks mm-hmm. and you still wouldn't have enough homes. So we decided to design new ways to do things using uh, unfired bricks, new, new kinds of technologies to make new mm-hmm. roofing tiles and so on. Uh, and those are um, sold in the marketplace. This is not a charity. We don't no. believe that by giving away things you're mm-hmm. going to create solutions so that work. So you innovate technologies. And yes. innovate delivery systems. Yes. So we innovate technologies for all these things, water mm-hmm. and energy and so on. Cooking, for example. Cook stoves were one of our major, major products because uh, several hundred million women in India suffer this horrible you know, lung cancer and, and diseases because of the smoke in the kitchen. Oh, okay. And so we wanted to change that. Okay. We did that by innovation. And another very fascinating thing I found was the building that you have created for development alternatives. Yes. And I would love to hear about it. And recently I found out that it won a national award for the greenest yes. building in the country. So yes. describe the building to Thank us. You. How is it uh, Well, the different? President of India uh, gave us an award last Friday uh, uh-huh. to give us... Uh, um, the greenest building. It's probably the greenest building in the world today. Really? Yes, because it's actually 10 years of its time. Uh, it uses virtually um, entirely uh, recycled materials and uh, unfired, um, virtually no energy in the building, really? in the construction of it, mm-hmm. and very little energy in operating it. I and, see. you know, in, in a place like Delhi, which reaches temperatures of 112, 115, mm-hmm. um, to have a building that does, doesn't really need an air conditioner, that's quite a remarkable uh-huh. feat. How did you do that? Well, by, by passive design, by orientation, by the kinds of materials, by uh, opening and closing windows at the right time, uh-huh. and keeping the, night cool, the coolness of the night inside the building, and lots of very interesting ways. Wow. But it is possible. We've um, got cooling systems, but they're uh-huh. very, very low energy cooling I systems. See. So it's a, it's a great building. It's a five-story building plus a basement, mm-hmm. and uh, it will house some 350 people. 
but it's a very high tech building, and uh, everybody wants uh, to rent space in it. It's it's actually really? very beautiful. Do yes. you give tours of the building? Oh yes, we we're oh. proud of our building, and it's actually a, um, a ca become becoming a, um, a kind of a place for, of pilgrimage. People want to come and see it because it is different. Oh. Dr. Kosla, as an expert on the environment, what would you say are the top five threats to our planet? Well, today uh, I think everybody knows about climate change, and mm -hmm. this is a threat which comes from the fact that we've been using our fossil fuels, our petroleum and coal and gas, natural gas, to uh, a very large extent, uh, very pro in a profligate kind of way. Okay. So that is certainly a major threat. Mm -hmm. I think almost as big a threat is the disappearance of many of our species. Third, very important threat, mm -hmm. which is the oceans. Yes. Uh, our fisheries are collapsing. Uh, we've wiped out very large numbers of major fisheries on which many people, including very poor people, depend for their protein yes. and so on. Mm -hmm. But of all the threats, the biggest one of all, in my opinion, is the continued existence of poverty. Poverty is a, a threat not just to the poor, mm -hmm. but also to the rich. Uh, poverty leads to the destruction of certain kinds of resources on which we all depend, including soils mm -hmm. and waters, and po simply because of the necessity of survival, not yes. because of greed. Mm -hmm. uh, poverty leads to alienation and violence and terrorism. Poverty leads to a variety of, of breakdowns in society and environment. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that is ultimately the really big threat. I see. So these are four, uh, in my opinion, um, cyclic threats which relate to each other. So it's very difficult in a sense to say which is bigger or smaller right. because they're all related. Right. Uh, the fifth threat is the fact that uh, our affairs, global affairs, are um, determined by what we call the nation state. And every nation and every country and every society seems to think that they have a right to uh, uh, have everything. And this doesn't work on a finite planet. So an infinite need, where, which is uncontrolled by any kind of coherent uh, decision-making system, uh, imposed on a finite resource base, is a recipe for disaster. So I would say these are the five big threats. Okay, and what are the top five adjustments the rich have to make to save the environment and these resources? Five big things that uh, uh, people in, in the north, people, rich people, affluent people, can do is, first of all, to reduce the consumption of material resources, okay. which is really hurting mm -hmm. very much. The second is energy. Okay. Uh, you have to now really change your methods of energizing the number of energy slaves that we have have to be reduced. Okay. The third is water. The other two things that I think the rich can do is start looking at the impact of their uh, actions on poverty and reducing it. Because the most urgent thing for, from the point of view of the rich, mm -hmm. as well as from the point of view of the poor, is to reduce the growth of population. This planet cannot handle 9 billion people. There is no way that by the year 2050, as mm -hmm. you said earlier, uh, we're going to have 9 billion people. They, they won't be able to survive at, at any reasonable standard of living. So to that extent, I think we've got all to make the most urgent. And it's not a matter of abortions and giving contraceptives. It's a matter of improving the lives of girls. Uh, and my feeling is that uh, the most uh, important thing they can do is to support the empowerment of people uh, all over the world, uh, which is not a convenient thing because people get threatened by that. What are the top five organizations related to the environment? Well, obviously, uh, I'm biased. I work with some of them, so uh, I, work with quite uh, a few. I think the one in, in India is the one that, because I designed it, I had the choice of doing whatever I thought was the most important, mm -hmm. and I think development alternatives as a social enterprise, not a charity, mm -hmm. but a business that works in the field of social and environmental good and makes it its, its work through the marketplace. Uh, I think that's a good one. Uh, the World Conservation Union, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is the largest scientific organization working on biodiversity. I think that's extremely important. 
I work with uh, the Club of Rome, and uh, our uh, work has really goes back 40 years. Uh, and our first book, Limits to Growth, was probably the most important starting point for the environmental movement. Yes. Uh, it was read by large numbers of people, and it impacted uh, thinking around the world in a way that only a nuclear explosion would do. And so it's been extremely important. I would say there are uh, organizations that we need to nurture, which are not performing well enough, like the mm -hmm. United Nations. The whole United Nations system is important for the world. Uh, and I hope that we can do much more with it. Uh, and I suppose I would say that ultimately civil society, NGOs, the people who don't get voluntary organizations, that don't get paid mm -hmm. but do good things uh, as a group are very important. So those are my f five favorites. All right. And which country would be considered a model of success in developing sustainably? I, frankly, very few. In fact, I would have said almost none except for one. And it's a tiny little country. Mm -hmm. It's a neighbor, it's a country that neighbors mine, uh, and it's a phenomenal commitment to sustainability because it's sort of a Buddhist country which decided that um, uh, development means uh, human development and not uh, simply. Uh, material development, and that's Bhutan. I'm very impressed, and I spent some time there this year, and I must admit it was the most amazing experience I've ever had, mm -hmm. where people are actually totally committed to improving their lives without hurting nature. And uh, one of the indicators that they have in there, they don't measure gross domestic product. GDP, GNP is not important to them. Mm -hmm. What is important is gross national happiness. Okay. And one of the indicators of happiness, for, for example, is how much time they get to pray. So these are people who have decided uh, a totally different path to human fulfillment. And I think it's wonderful. Which is the best book on the environment that you would recommend people read? There are many books, and you can find them. I, my two favorite recent books are actually two books that we commissioned <coughs> in the Club of Rome. The first is called The Factor of Five, <coughs> Factor Five book, which is available from most uh, uh, online stores. Factor Five shows you how to live better with fewer resources. Okay. Factor of Five, mm -hmm. less resources. And uh, the other one is The Blue Economy. The nice. Blue Economy is uh, this one here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, about innovations derived and inspired by nature. How to use nature to do your work for you without paying for it. Mm -hmm. And it's the way of creating literally tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of jobs for people that are fulfilling and good and rewarding. And uh, Dr. Khosla, what is your message for our viewers, especially for people out there who think that climate change and uh, global warming are media <coughs> hype or things blown out of proportion? What would you like to tell them? Well, I would say that in the case of climate change and species extinction, the media are underplaying it. They're not hyping it. They're uh, actually not reporting how bad things are. So I would say that um, you have to tell your viewers that uh, they're going to be responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, and the measure of their responsibility is how they think they're going to leave the world behind for their next generation that is unlivable uh, unless they change. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the way we think, we live, the way yes. we use resources. And our value systems. Okay, on that note, Dr. Kosla, thank you so much thank for you. coming by and making time for this. I appreciate it very much, and I'm sure our viewers will find it very informative. Thank you very much for inviting me. We have another guest, Anu Mehal, who is the U.S. Goodwill Ambassador for Development Alternatives. She's also a CEO and co-founder of Platinum Organics, a private label manufacturer of apparel and home furnishings, and a board member of El Camino Hospital here in the Bay Area. And of course, a wife and mother too. Anu, welcome to Jai with Manjula. Thank you so much, and thank you for making time for us. Well, thank you for introducing me to Dr. Khosla. He's a true visionary, and he has an amazing and unique way of uh, presenting 
problems and solutions related to sustainable development, then I believe he's your uh, inspiration, he's your mentor. So tell us about your involvement with the organization Development Alternatives and uh, the work that's doing. Well, like I said, thank you, first of all, for giving us an opportunity to come. And, and this is a great platform. And I'm glad that you're doing a wonderful work sharing with people about all the different nonprofits. Uh, Dr. Khosla is uh, not just my mentor, but millions of people think of him uh-huh. in, in that space. This, his work essentially is, um, uh, well, one, one would say is this, is that it is not very sensational work. And it's proactive work. So, and these days in the media, uh, any kind of a sensationalism uh, gets uh, publicized quite a bit. And actual work and that Gandhian uh, policy or philosophy that be the change that you want to see in the world, uh, this is what Dr. Khosla is doing. And I met him and was really inspired to see the recycled paper products which are used in very large scale hotels, in a lot of different industries. And the work, when people think about um, uh, this kind of work, they think that maybe it is used in small places, but it's extremely productive uh, work. And one would be very proud to be using it in US or any other place in the world. I see. So tell us, how can people get involved with development alternatives? How can they support it over here? And what's your contact information if they want to get in touch with you? Absolutely. The best way of contacting, at least to read about his work, is www.dewalt, which is D-E-V-A-L-T dot org. Mm -hmm. And you have my information, which is my email address and phone number, which I'm sure that you will share with the audience. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would again say that uh, this work is extremely important work Mm -hmm. and it is really not a very tedious or boring work he's actually a rock star in (laughs) a lot of people's minds it just is that uh, this work requires some serious um, concentration Mm -hmm. and i am very glad that you gave us this opportunity today to share our thoughts with you my pleasure and i wish you all the best with your work thank you so much alternatives thank you nice having you here thank you that's all we have for you today. Earlier, our guest was Dr. Ashok Khosla, Chairman of Development Alternatives, who is also known globally as the Green Crusader. The organization innovates and delivers eco-solutions that reduce poverty and regenerate the environment. It also influences and spearheads major policy changes that promote sustainable development and empowerment of the marginalized. Dr. Khosla's message and analysis as an expert on the environment are crystal clear. Global warming, climate change, and depletion of natural resources are real and a major threat facing the world today. And responsibility lies with each one of us in the developed world to save the planet by changing the way we live, the way we consume resources, especially energy. You may watch this show again at tiewithmanjula.org. Thank you all for joining us. I'll be back with another inspiring story about giving and people making a difference. For Chai with Manjula, I'm Manjula Gupta. See you next time.